Thank you guys so much. It's so good to worship God. Yes, amen. So grateful to have you guys here worshiping with us too. Welcome again. My name is Tim Mellinger, Pastor Bill's son. Obvious, right? I know, I know. The more you get to know me, the more obvious it is. Uh, so grateful to be here with you guys and uh, the opportunity to share with you. I am looking forward to what God has to say. Uh, by the way, uh, my parents are grandparents to a third kid now. Amen. So Tatum, Olivia was born on 7 7. So July 7th, and can't wait till the opportunity that I have to see her as well. I love being an uncle, and so uh, my parents are having a good time with the family there. Well, we are doing this series, I Will Not Be Afraid, and we are going through Psalms, and I've got an echo of a car horn playing for us. <laughs> So, uh, we are going through Psalms, and question for you is, what do you do when you feel someone is standing against you? When you feel someone is standing against God, what do you do? How do you respond when you feel stress, anger, worry, because someone stands against you or what you perceive as God's ways? Today, what's what's happening in our world, fear can have a powerful influence over our behavior. Maybe you feel there are people who stand against you, thwarting good in your life. Or you may be concerned there are people, adversaries, standing against your values, standing against what you know are God's values. Republicans may fear Biden getting elected. Democrats may fear Trump getting reelected. You may worry about contracting COVID, while others worry about freedom of worship and religion, where that might be taken away. Parents may fear a fall where kids are not in school in person, instead at home. Or workers may fear losing their job. I think we need an antidote. I think God has an antidote for us when there is fear, and when there is fear called by either the very real presence of people who stand against us, or the perceptions that we have of people who are standing against us. David faced this, and in Psalms 56, the, the header to Psalms 56 is what, is what we're going to look at, this, this song, this prayer of David, uh, says, when the Philistines seized him at Gath. The Bible then records this prayer, this song about this time in David's life. And it demonstrates God's antidote to dealing with distress, angst, and fear when adversaries stand against us. And if David can bring his fear to God, then maybe I can too. And maybe you can too. Dr. Arnold says, the fear of God makes no man do anything mean or dishonorable. But the fear of man does lead to all sorts of weakness and baseness. The fear of God does not cause us to do evil. But when we are afraid of others, others' opinions of us, that can cause a devastating effect in how we hurt others. Proverbs 29.25 says, Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. If we're honest with ourselves, we can give undeserved power to our worries about other people and how their actions affect our lives. Yet God wants to meet us directly in this fear and release us from the power we give it over us. Now, Psalms, if you're looking at big picture, there's these poems, right? These songs that are in, in God's, God's Bible, God's great story. Why, why are they there? As, as I shared two weeks ago last time, Psalms really is the prayer book of God's people. It's the echo of the soul. It reverberates, reflects back the sound in the souls of humanity. 
It, as Athanasius says, it's the mirror of the soul. John Calvin said it's the anatomy of the soul. It digs out and, it, and it, you see all the different colors and, and shades of what the soul is and, and our fears, our longings, our desires, our thoughts. What is truly inside us, deep within. These are in the Bible, in God's great story, to show us that there's a place to bring to God's table for all of our emotions, including fear of enemies, adversaries, those who stand against us, whether perceived or real. As a, a Christian leader uh, says it like this, all of human life can be summarized, summarized by this. You get hurt, it makes you sad. If it makes you really sad, you get mad. And then you make a decision whether you go to bad. Ain't that the truth? The Psalms are rescuing us from going to this place of bad. The Psalms are like God's rescue mission. Pastor says this, not in denying these realities and not even by denying us the possibility of saying these things out loud, but by saying them out loud before God, the one who can handle it all, and in the company of the people of God who would bear it with us, we experience freedom, we experience release. So let's look at one way David responded to those standing against him. If you can open your Bibles, open your phone apps to Psalms 56. We're going to look at the first four verses to start with, and they'll be on the screen as well. So Psalms 56, start with verse 1. Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So this psalm reflects a time in David's life that we can read about in 1 Samuel 21. And also you see chapters of this where David is fleeing and has gone to, to Gath, to Philistine territory, all the way up to chapter 27 of 1 Samuel. When David flees King Saul, though, by escaping to Gath, Gath is ruled, city ruled by the Philistines, the mortal enemies of the Israelites. And David flees because Saul, king over the Israelites, has become jealous as people are declaring and singing and praising and worship and praising David. Saul too, right? Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. And Saul, in his baggage, in his insecurity, is jealous of that, does not like that. And Saul pursues David, seeking to kill him, seeking to destroy him. David, this guy who rescued the Israelites as a young man, killing Goliath, shepherd boy, just with his stone. David, the one person who is willing to stand up, stand up and transform the climate around the Israelites and rescue them from the onslaught of the Philistines by killing Goliath. David who Saul, when tormented in his heart and in his spirit, David, who would play the lyre so that Saul could fall asleep. This is the David who Saul was after, to kill and to destroy. And so David, it says, he says, when I am afraid, David acknowledges, man, this is, this young man who has seen God do so much through him, who has killed tens of thousands, right? Who has, who has brought justice, who has rescued Israelite, the Israelites. This young man, he acknowledges, there is times when I am afraid. And what does he say? When I am afraid, what do I do? I place my trust in God. How desperate, though, must David have been to escape the frying pan, to jump into the fire. Right? He escapes, he's, he's fleeing from Saul in his homeland, and so where does he go? The mortal enemy's land. He goes to Gath to flee Saul. And when there, people find out, and the king finds out that David, who has killed 
thousands of the Philistines, of their own people, says, we have to do something about David. The report is given to the king. And so David is brought before, and, and David feels the weight of this, feels the risk that is at his life. And, and it says, it is fascinating what David does. He acts like a crazy man. He acts insane. And this is his strategy to escape. And so they believe that he is, in, that he is insane, that he's gone crazy, that he's gone mad in the head. So they think, this isn't the man that has done all of this. He is not in the right state of mind anymore. We don't need to do anything to him. And yet David... This was a battle. We see the honest struggle, the honest prayer that David gives here in this passage. Because, yeah, David couldn't believe that Saul would actually kill him. David being on the run for his life. In verse 12 of 1 Samuel 21, it says, As David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of a chief's king of Gath. And so for David, the question was, and for us, the question is, does being afraid lead you to trust God more or less? Conversely, does not trusting God lead you to be more afraid or less? And how can we choose faith, even in moments where we are tempted to be afraid, even in seasons where we are tempted to be afraid? David's prayer that, that we're reading here in Psalm 56, it's a prayer of lament. He's lamenting what is going on. But then it shifts. And even as he's praying, as he's writing this, it shifts from a prayer of lament to a prayer of trusting and declaring his confidence in God. Because he has gone to God with his concerns. Keep on going with verse 5 of Psalm 56. David says, All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, hoping to take my life. Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this, I will know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? Amen? Amen. Today, I catch myself making some mistakes when it comes to my perception of someone standing against me and the stress, the frustration, the fear that creates. I find often can do one of two mistakes. And I don't think God is wanting us to do either of these. When, when I am afraid, when I am angry, when I feel someone standing against me, I can bottle up, try to pretend like I'm going to be that good Christian, that good follower of God, and... And I'm just going to tough on through and push on through when someone is standing against me and try to show them love. Or I can do the opposite of just let it out, that rage, that anger. This is not right. This is unfair. Like, I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And sometimes I'm afraid of the feelings that I would have. If I actually acknowledge what that person is saying to me, if I actually acknowledge what that person, there might be a needle of truth in that haystack of what that person is saying. And actually acknowledge what this person might be saying that seems to be standing against me. So I think there's a couple mistakes we make. And I think it especially shows up in relationships with those we're closest to us. But when there are people who we feel stand against us. Maybe it comes up in social media. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a boss. You've been fired, and this feels like an injustice. This person is an enemy of you. Po possibly, it is possibly shows up in the loss of a of marriage relationship, and 
and someone who has cheated and left you. Maybe it shows up in a broken relationship with a child or shows up in political arguments that you have if, with family over what is happening in our country or what is happening with, with, uh, with who is in leadership. Maybe you feel like the enemy is someone who you wear masks and they don't. And, and I believe God wants to meet us and wants to give us some antidotes to how to deal with the stress, the angst, even the anger that we feel when we feel st people are standing against us or people are standing against what we believe are God's ways. The, the one mistake that I see myself making, and I, and, I, and I think many of us make, is when something does not go my way, I become the victim of my story. And so I feel helpless. Relationships, marriages often offer the best indicator of how we're doing in this area. I mean, maybe not for you, but wowzer. Man, I sure do see my flaws come out that I try my best to keep hidden in relationship with my significant other. I've been noticing the girlfriend doesn't like something. She has the audacity to tell me. I mean, what gives? <laughs> what nerve, right? All too often, my auto response is disagreement. That's not true. Like, you're not seeing it from my side. You don't understand. Like, you're wrong. There's a defensiveness. There's, there's an attempt to change her perspective, to deflect, to make excuses, to put the blame back on her. It's her fault. You're, it's your fault why you're having this argument. Rather than seeing the needle of truth in the haystack of what she's saying, so I've been reflecting this week, and it's been hitting home to me. I'm realizing there's brokenness, and there's, there's messiness inside of me that has I've been afraid of facing. I've been afraid of acknowledging. I've been afraid of those emotions. I mean, why am I so afraid to consider what she is saying might actually be true of me? Why do I get so afraid of that? I mean, I think, grow up with my parents too, and there's those who are closest you can have the greatest conflicts, right? Because we we're not putting on the masks anymore. Like we are seeing each other, and and I see this relationship with with my parents, and my dad. Why is it so hard for me? Why am I so afraid of facing the truth that he might say to me, the thing that triggers me, right? Those are close to us. They we know how to trigger each other, right? And why am I afraid of that? Instead, why can't I say, you know, maybe you're right. And actually consider. And maybe, just maybe, I'm not the only one in this room or who's online who is tempted to do this when things don't go my way. Think what often happens is th there are very, very real situations where we are victims. There is where, where someone has wronged us. And there is also what we do when someone has wronged us, whether for real or whether in our perception. And we can take on this victim mentality. We can feel like we are helpless. We can, f we can which then shifts to a defensiveness. So for instance, when someone doesn't invite you to the party, you spin it that they did it for you. They have something against you. There is a conflict there. You blame, right? I blame. Poor me. We have this habitual thought process that spins into self-pity, feeling sorrow for myself and feeling trapped. The second mistake that I'm catching myself making, and maybe you make this too, Every victim needs a villain, and I look for someone to blame. I feel defensive. No, that's not me. That's not my issue. Like, it's you. There's something wrong with your communication style to me. Like, why don't you just understand this? The problem I'm realizing, though, is when I shift into this mode, what happens is now I've given all my power 
to the perpetrator. I have given all my power over my emotions, over my state of mind, over my thought process to this other person. And I'm creating feelings of helplessness, disappointment, anger, and fear. And more often than not, I just do it unconsciously. It just happens. I put them in the position of villain and me in the position of victim. Now, here's the key. And here is where I think how David has lived and how we see his prayers is so transformative and is so powerful for us today. And for us, when we struggle with this, blaming, feeling defensive, putting, putting us in the, in the position of victim and others in the position of villain, See, the reason we're experiencing these negative emotions in those moments is because of a thought that we are thinking and not something that person said. If I'm the reason I'm feeling shame in that moment, I still have the power. If I give the credit for feeling shame to that person, then I hand my power over to them. So, for example, None of you have blue hair, do you, here? So, for example, if someone says to you, I really hate your blue hair. I, I can't stand it. I hate it. You're probably not going to start crying, are you? You're probably not going to start yelling at them or arguing with them. It's probably not going to hurt your feelings. You're not going to drop into victim mode. Most of you won't go there. Well, some of you could even go there for that. Maybe, if you fall really deep, deep into this victim mentality. But why are you not going to go and feel like you're the victim and getting angry and get your feelings hurt? The reason why, the reason you won't get hurt is because there's no part of you that believes that you have blue hair. No part of you believes it. So when someone says something to you and you do believe it, there's, that there's a part of you that believes it, that's when it really gets to you. And it gets to me, isn't it? And that's what triggers us. Because we think those things she's saying to me about, man, I wish you wouldn't have done this last minute. Like that triggers something. I don't want to admit that's a weakness of me. No, I, and yet there's some that believes. Yeah, I see that as a weakness. I struggle with doing things last minute. But there's a fear to acknowledge that. No, I'm going to deny. I'm going to pretend like it's not there. And so when someone says something to you and you do believe it, that's when it really gets to you. The reason why is because the thought that you're thinking that believes the thing that they're saying you believe it. When it does get to you, it's because there's a part of you that believes it. Now, the hope, and I think the example of David, is that this can be an opportunity to truly connect to the negative part of you that does believe that negative comment. To not be afraid to humbly, to vulnerably step into that and say, what is the needle of truth in the haystack of what this person is saying? Mm -hmm. And so I believe God, David really got the antidotes that God has given when people stand against us, where there, when there are things that trigger our defensiveness or feeling helpless or feeling like a victim. And let me just clarify, I am not trying to undermine or deny that there is real pain that we suffer because people do us wrong. And there may be something that's deep inside that you have suffered because someone else has wronged you. The hope that I think David shows us, and that God is trying to show us through David, is that whether we are really the victim or we just perceive ourselves as the victim, we don't have to stay there. God wants to set us free. God has given us antidotes to be set free, to be released from this, that we can live in freedom and joy and peace again, no matter what the climate is around us. And so the antidotes, our vulnerability, vulnerability with ourselves, and vulnerability with David. David is vulnerable with himself. And you see this 
throughout his life, if you read the other songs, the other songs that he has written, he acknowledges his mistakes. He is vulnerable in his ability to not care what others think and dance in the streets before God because he is, he is crying out to God and because of his connection and worship of God. David, despite his failures, he was willing to acknowledge he is afraid he was willing to verbalize his emotions when people are doing unjust to him, when Saul is out to get him, when it feels like everyone is, is pursuing him and attacking him, seeking to destroy him. He acknowledges the enemies. And David is willing to be vulnerable to acknowledge his mistakes. Now, when we have a victim mentality, it creates defensiveness, this learned helplessness. But vulnerability, on the other hand, it is showing up, being all in, and being willing to experience any emotion. Vulnerability requires courage. It be, to be willing to feel any emotion that comes up. See, David feels any of these emotions, comes up, and he tells God, he gives them to God. You look at Habakkuk, this prophet who he is very straight up honest with God. You can go through the Bible and look at the honest prayers of the faithful followers of God, of Jesus, and the vulnerability that they have. Even Jesus, before he knows he's about to get arrested and arrested and crucified, and, and he asks God to take this cup from me. Right? The vulnerability Jesus has to say, it, it says he's he's. He's under so much stress, right? That blood is coming out of the sweat, right? And that Jesus, his vulnerability to go before God and be alone with God, to be real to himself and real with God, it's courageous and it is transformative. And David says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, God. David takes his concern about his enemies and his adversaries directly to God. So when you're willing to accept the parts of you that aren't perfect, you maintain your power. In fact, you maintain God's power. You maintain your ability to not be a victim because nothing can be used against you if you admit it, if it's all true. So vulnerability, trusting God, releases us from the power that adversaries or those who stand against us would have over us. Now, if David can have confidence to bring his fear to God, maybe I can too. Maybe you can too. And maybe I can be released from the power I may give adversaries over me. There is a, a leader, a business leader, who received an email from someone she used to work with. And it was a very adversarial email. And this person who had worked with her was saying all these bad things about how, what she had done and how she was an awful leader and she was not, she was just was messing up. And this stirred something into her. And immediately you could think, man, she is going to argue. She's going to convince us, oh, that's not true. She's going to explain. And yet what she does, her response, she collects herself. She's vulnerable with herself. And she, and she responds back. And not in a sarcastic, but in a very genuine way. You know, that's all true. And she dissipated that conflict. She dissipated that anger, dissolved that anger that was there from this coworker, simply because she was willing to acknowledge there may be a needle of truth in the haystack of what this person was saying. I tried that this week. <laughs> I somehow caught myself quick enough to not shift into defensiveness quick enough to not shift into blame or helplessness. And man, it transformed something that was a conflict. There was anger stirring up in both of us. And suddenly there was freedom, there was joy, and there was laughter. Because I was, I was willing to say in that moment <laughs> that 
you know, you're right. What if we could have that posture of vulnerability where we're not afraid to go to those feelings that's, that someone might be right, that someone who's standing against us, there might be a truth, a needle truth in the haystack of what they're saying. God is big enough for us. God, God is strong enough to receive our emotions, to receive our angst, to receive our fear. And God has created you in his character, in his likeness. We have the Imago Dei, the image of God wired into us. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, God has given his spirit living inside of us to be able to discern right from wrong, to be able to, I think too, be vulnerable and humble with ourselves and with God and transform situations, environments, relationships where it feels like people are staying against us or staying against what we perceive are God's ways. David cried out to God. David placed trust in God. Now, when David says he trusts God, this is connected to vulnerability. What, what he is saying and what this word means, it, David is saying to, to trust is to cling to, to hold fast. So it's, it's this notion of this like really tight grip. It's also this notion of an intimate relationship, a personal intimate relationship. And so what David is saying is when I fear, I trust in you, God. What he is saying is when I fear, like I fall down, I call out, I cling to in humility, in desperation, in urgency. I am clinging to God. God, I need you. God, help me. God, intercede to throw oneself down on one's face and say, I need you. And for better or worse, sometimes it takes real pain, real enemies, real difficulty and hurt for us to get to that posture, doesn't it? What if we could say, today, no, today it's not going to take that real hurt. It's not going to take me hitting rock bottom to get that urgency, to get to that humility to cling to God. What if today... With what is on your mind, with what, with what your worries are, your fears, your angers and angst. What if today you said, in a posture of humility and urgency, God, I cling to you in this. And you express your emotions that you have. You are real with God. You are vulnerable to, to lay before God. These are the emotions I'm feeling. And you trust God with them. Moses and the Israelites who struggled as they, as they left Egypt and, in, and were going toward the promised land. They struggled with this. And in Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14, there's this word of promise and encouragement to them. And it says, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. May that be our declaration of hope too. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord will fight for you. For good and for your good. Trust and see. Someone once said, we tend to be miserable but we don't like it, so we create all sorts of diversions. We watch TV, we surf the internet, we play video games, we do all sorts of things to create diversions because we don't like how miserable we are. A guy named Soren Kierkegaard says, if I could subscribe one remedy for the human condition, I'd assign everyone to sit alone in silence in their room to meditate on their misery. And, and, and the reason why Kierkegaard says this, because what we often do is rather than think about our misery, rather than being vulnerable enough to step into those emotions and to step into it with God, 
and be vulnerable with enough to give God those emotions. Rather than that, we create these diversions, all sorts of diversions. And you know what it is for you. Man, for me, there's times when I'm stressed, I gotta go whip out that thing of ice cream. And that, that distracts me, that soothes my angst, my worries. Now, it's gotta be good ice cream, right? It's gotta be gelato, but, but it's gotta be good stuff. But that, that, that is one of my coping mechanisms, right? Something that is good, but something that I use because I am too cowardly to be vulnerable and step into those emotions and be honest with those emotions and be comfortable sitting with, man, I feel despair. Man, I feel hopelessness. I, I don't feel like I'm good enough. But to be able to be willing to step into those emotions those thoughts that I have playing in my head and to step into those with God, that is powerful, folks. That is when addictions you've had for a lifetime are broken. That is when relationships that have been broken are healed. That is when you, when there has been mindsets that have been keeping you down, you are set free from those mindsets. They no longer hold you back from achieving the dreams that God has given you. God has given you dreams. And the way to those dreams is often through the vulnerability to step into those fears, to acknowledge those fears and step into those fears with God. It is okay to be discouraged. It's okay to be at a hard place in your life. It is okay to be sad, to be angry. Those are emotions that God has created us as humans to experience. The transformative thing is, what do we do with those emotions? And so will you choose today to take a step of vulnerability, to step into those emotions, to invite God into those emotions with you? Man, I sure want to. Because I'm seeing glimmers of how it shifts and transforms my relationships, how it transforms my mindset. And I also see how this has been something that holds me back from what God wants to do in and through my life. And what if God could set us all free because we are willing to be vulnerable as we trust God, as we cling to God? I just want to pause for a moment, and I want to practice a listening prayer. And what that simply is is just having a minute where we are silent and we just invite God to meet us, to speak to us. And so will we just take a moment of silence and, and I'll say amen when we're done to invite God to be with us and just to listen with God and God's presence. Amen. I know that was very short. I invite you, that resonates with you, to find some space this afternoon, this week, to have some listening prayer with God and to listen in silence, to share with him your emotions, and then to listen what he wants to say to you and how he wants to meet you there. Another pastor, her respect, says, you know, anxiety, it's a signal alerting you and we'd like to invite the band to, to get ready to come back up and get to wrap up with this. So anxiety is a signal alerting you it's time to pray, to be vulnerable, to, to connect with God. In other words, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. If it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. 
The Apostle Paul says in Philippians, Be anxious for nothing, but in every situation take your requests to God. So if you're worried about an upcoming doctor's appointment, pray about it. If you're worried about a decision you need to make, pray about it. If you're worried about the state of our country, pray about it. Whatever you are worried about, pray about it. Because if it's on your heart, it's on God's heart. If it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. And you don't have to go there alone. If there is a deep wound, if there is something that is really vulnerable for you, I'd encourage you to share that with a trusted Christian. For, for some people, it might be a best friend, or, or Pastor Bill, or your small group leader. But I invite you to share that so that someone else can meet you in that vulnerability with God. Because we're meant to hold each other up and carry each other's burdens as we trust God with that. So a couple questions for reflection as we sing. And we're going to close off with a couple songs here. Where, and I encourage you to write down these questions, either on your phone, if you take notes, and reflect on these as you practice this listening prayer this week. And at the very least, write down, remember the question that strikes a chord most with you, and reflect on it this week. Where am I unwilling to feel my emotion? Where am I avoiding it? What dreams aren't I pursuing? What conversations am I unwilling to have because I don't want to feel the emotion that I'm going to create? Alternatively, who am I blaming for how I feel? When I feel anger, who am I blaming? When I feel sadness, who am I blaming? Am I blaming myself? Am I blaming other people? Or am I being vulnerable and open to feel whatever comes up? And to know that when that emotion comes up, I can feel it all the way through. And I can identify the thought pattern that's causing that emotion. And I can take 100% of the responsibility for how I feel. In that place, when I do that, I am in my, in my most vulnerable with myself, and I am in my most vulnerable with God. And that's when I can find my deepest connection with not just myself, but with the part of me that is much bigger than myself, that part of me that, that God created, that part of me to connect with the divine, that part of me then that transforms my heart, my mind, my behaviors, and how I love God, myself, and others. So will you reflect on that? as we sing in this week. Take it away, guys.